When The Lord of the Rings was first published in the mid-1950s, it was described as a bolt of lightning from a clear sky. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. It completely broke with any preconceived notions of what a novel could or should do. The most celebrated literary works in this period described a world full of chaos and confusion in which nothing could be relied upon, nothing could be taken for granted. Famous examples include The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot or George Orwell's dystopian novel 1984. Despair was seen in this works as the only legitimate response to a bleak post-war reality. Now, The Lord of the Rings, on the other hand, conveyed a sense of hope and beauty in the midst of sorrow. Because these were difficult times. In the 1950s, European culture was in ruins, and it had been for some time. The First World War had seen 20 million people dead, and a peace treatise which paved the way for future conflict. In the wake of the Great War, there was a pandemic, the so-called Spanish flu, which killed off another 50 million people around the world. Then, in 1929, a global economic crisis left millions more people bankrupt and homeless. The following decade, the 1930s, did not make things any better. Uh, it saw the rise, a spectacular rise, of totalitarian regimes across Europe in countries such as Spain, Germany, Italy, and the USSR. This, in turn, led to the Second World War, with its mass destruction on a vast scale and the infamous and tragic Holocaust. So, against this backdrop, the entire old order was seen as outdated and useless, definitely not something that you would want to hold on to to lead the way into a brighter future. Everybody was desperately looking for something new to hold on to. Now, in literature, at a first glance, The Lord of the Rings might not seem like a very likely candidate to renew this depressing state of affairs. After all, it was a book based on old literary models from classical antiquity, such as epic narratives or medieval romance. It was a work which was set in a pseudo-medieval world, and the main character belonged to an invented species, a hobbit, who set out on a quest to destroy a magic ring and save the world. How could anyone possibly relate to this? Well, millions of people did. And the fact is that The Lord of the Rings became one of the most widely read novels ever. Because Tolkien, despite the fact that he was a very traditional man, an old-fashioned, who loved history and had devoted his professional life to the study of dead languages, he had managed to find a very powerful imaginative outlet for his exceptional linguistic abilities. He was able to create something just as radically new as the modernists, but with the added benefit of bringing this sense of hope to his readers. Now, Tolkien's mind, it must be said, was highly original. Shockingly, this respected Oxford Don declared that his experiences in the trenches had triggered and developed an early interest in fairy stories, what he called a desire for dragons. So when he returned from the trenches himself in 1916, after having participated in the bloodiest battle of the First World War, the Battle of the Somme, he began writing his own original fairy stories to help his readers and himself renew their perception of reality. But the question is, how could this really original or very traditional man create something so original? Now, I think the answer to this question is related to the fact that he was, uh, in his work, he was combining three things to a very great effect, to spectacular effect. He was combining rationality, imagination, and creativity. And he would do this with great success. In terms of rationality, Tolkien had a very deep scientific understanding of language, that is, grammar, but also etymology, which is the phonetic and semantic development of words across the centuries, and even millennia. Tolkien was probably the world's leading expert on the history of the English language. He was well familiar with over 16 languages, many of them extinct, so he was a language genius. But in his professional life as a philologist, he frequently had to resort to his imagination and his creativity in order to recreate the context of these lost worlds that were conveyed to him through the words. He had to fill in missing gaps in 
damaged manuscripts that had been written in Old and Middle English. And in parallel, of course, he had been inventing his own languages for a very long time, ever since he was a child, in fact. So because of his professional engagement with philology, which is the study of language and literature, he knew that languages and stories, they would always go together. They were, in fact, inseparable. One thing could not exist without the other. So he realized that he needed a context for his own invented languages to make sense, to be coherent, and to develop, just like ordinary languages do in our, re in our real world. So in short, Tolkien needed to invent a world for his invented languages. But Tolkien also had a very original approach to the idea of invention. Now, the modern English verb invent actually comes from Latin, invenire, which means to discover. And so Tolkien frequently had the sense that he was not inventing anything, but merely discovering something which was already there. So uh, he realized that if he wanted to create a context for these languages, he would have to resort both to rationality and to imagination to do so. Now, I'm going to give you one example of how this worked. Now, let's consider the word hobbit. Um, famously, one day, Tolkien was marking exams on one summer day to earn a little bit of extra money, uh, and then he came across a blank sheet of paper. And on this paper, out of the blue, spontaneously, he writes down one sentence, and he writes, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit, just like that. And then he looks at this sheet of paper and he says to himself, a hobbit, what is that? I have to find out. So Tolkien reckoned that if there had been a word in modern English such as hobbit, it must have looked differently a thousand years ago in old English. So by using a process which has been referred to as reversed etymological engineering, Tolkien traced the roots of this invented word, Hobbit, back in time and arrived at the conclusion that a thousand years ago, Hobbit must have been Holbytlan, which is an old English word. And what does Holbytlan mean? It means one who digs holes in the ground. So after having combined his scientific understanding of language with his imagination to discover what a Hobbit is, he was able to create the context for these creatures, for these characters. He created the Shire, which is the place where they live. He created characters, Bilbo, Frodo, Merry Pippin, and the others. And he created their culture, the way they interacted among themselves and with other communities in the larger whole of Middle-earth, which he had already previously discovered in a similar way by using invented words as a starting point. Now, the big question is, how is any of this relevant to us today? And this is a question that I'm frequently asked as a researcher and teacher of fantasy literature and of Tolkien in particular. People come to me and they say, all right, Martin, all this Tolkien stuff, very interesting, but why should I care? I mean, how is this even relevant to us today in the real world? Because this is a fantasy world, right? And I say to these, pe uh, to these people, I say, it has everything to do with our own world. It even has a lot to do with our own world in the 21st century. Because I think that with virtual realities and artificial intelligence, uh, actively and very rapidly transforming our world, I think there is a really strong need to preserve and update what's valuable from the past and up make it available in the present again in new shapes. And I think that we can learn a lot from Tolkien's example if we want to do this. Because Tolkien, by combining rationality and imagination in this very creative way, bringing the past into the present, he was able to come up with new and unexpected and very useful perspectives that would help his readers tackle the challenges of modern reality. The Lord of the Rings actually brought to the forefront urgently modern problems long before they appeared on any political agenda. I'm going to give you three examples of this. The first, the Ents. Now, an Ent is an old English word meaning giant, but in, in Tolkien's version of the story, he turns these giants into huge trees who move and feel and speak. These are sentient beings. So what they do in Tolkien's story is that they challenge our assumptions about uh, the exclusively anthropocentric points of view as the only valid perspective, right? He problematizes issues of um, an excessive uh, exploitation of natural resources and industrial pollution long before these things were seriously debated in parliaments or in Congress. I'm going to give you the second example. Uh, Tolkien also highlights the virtues of 
taking into account the perspectives of multiple ethnicities for geopolitical problem solving. Take the Fellowship of the Ring. This is a group of people who have been entrusted with the task of helping the ring bearer destroy the ring and save the world. But this group is made up of representatives from different communities, from different ethnicities, if you wish, dwarves, humans, elves, and hobbits. Each of these representatives bring into this very heterogeneous group their own traditions from the past. Uh, but it's only when they interact with each other that they are able to collectively come up with the really good solutions to tackle the problems that they are faced with on the road to Mordor uh, or in the War of the Rings. So, and this was before the United Nations was created in 1945. Um, another example is the hobbits themselves, right? These holbitlan or hole diggers. Now, this might seem like a, a very irrelevant minority, even a literal minority, right, being so small. But these are the ones who actually end up saving the world. So Tolkien tells us that there is a point in taking into account the perspectives of seemingly insignificant minorities, because we never know whether or not they might be able to come up with the really good solutions to the problems we have to face in the present and in the future. The point is that Middle-earth is our own world, but seen from a different perspective. And if we want to save this world from an overwhelming virtuality, I think we would do well not to discard what's valuable from the past just because it's old, but rather strive to update it and make it available again in the present. And Tolkien tells us anyone can do this. In Middle-earth, just like in our own world, even the smallest of hobbits can dig holes in historical ground and then fill them with new marvels. Thank you. Thank you.